So welcome again to the Belgrade meetup. I'm very excited to be here. This is also the first meetup we've done in Europe as well, which is pretty cool. My name is Andrew Lamb. I'm a staff engineer at Influx Data, and I'm also on the and I've done databases for quite a while, like uh, and worked almost entirely on my career in enterprise software. I'm also currently the Apache Arrow Data Fusion, uh, sorry, the Apache Data Fusion PMC chair, and I'm also on the Apache Arrow PMC in past chair. So like I've done a bunch of this. And so what I want to talk about initially is basically just to set the stage for the rest of the talks tonight, what data fusion is, like at a super high level, why you might want to use it, and then some part of how it's done. Like I, I can talk at length in various technical ways, but I'm going to try to keep it at a high level because there's lots of other technical stuff coming. So the first thing is, what is data fusion? I, I love this slide. I know some people don't love it. But Right. They didn't have to rebuild all the compiler low-level infrastructure, like the loop unrolling and the various and the debug tools and all that stuff. They just use LLVM and then they It's just like it's very expensive and it's it's hard to it's um it's basically well understood now how to do it but it's still a lot of work and instead you focus your time and you'll hear a bunch of people in the talks i think talk about this you focus your time on the features that actually make your product unique rather than uh the low level stuff so this is some high level use cases we have uh it's used everything from basically building entire systems on top of we've got several people here talking about that tonight including my company at flexdb we built our new version of data uh, on top of it. And then there's also people who use just the front end, right? They use it for various uh, analysis and SQL, SQL stuff. We have Piotr here from SDF who does that. And there's a bunch of other ones too. Uh, we also have the people who use it just for the back end, right? So just the execution operators, because uh, they, they have some other, say, SQL planner like Spark. It also turns out to implement table formats, like which are becoming more and more important these days in the analytics space. You need something that looks an awful lot like a query engine, right, that actually is able to evaluate expressions, manipulate data, run compactions, that kind of stuff. So either your op, you know, turns out all the Rust implementations of these table formats, uh, like Delta Lake, Apache, Iceberg, Lance, and Hootie all use Data Fusion too. And we're also increasingly seeing people use Data Fusion as a like a way to do academic experiments. And there's some cool examples of like specialized indexes, for example, for time series, like some version of an OLAP cube. That's a cool, uh, cool link there and. People are working on optimizers and stuff. So it's so it's like seeing use cases all over the place. The traditional reason why people didn't do this, at least why they claim not to, was because performance. When you're trying to build one of these high performance analytic systems, you typically like the typical design pattern is you have to basically own the system and the software from the data layout all the way up through the execution engine and the memory layout and all the kernels and stuff. Um, and in fact, that's if you look at the the major players in analytic systems, certainly in the last 10 years, they all have that high level uh, characterization. The challenge they're the typical reason is because the, the rationale, at least, was that you need to be able to optimize those APIs in order to properly get a sufficient performance. And if you force APIs on systems, that uh, the performance suffers. So I think what we've actually found with Data Fusion is now those, those APIs are very well understood. And by um, defining them and taking advantage of, of open source, which I'll talk about in a minute, we're actually able to get very, very fast performance. So these performances were very close to. Uh, DuckDB's performance on Parquet, and we're getting we're getting closer all the time. So I think it's it's done. So at a high level, right? I just want to talk about. Like you can tell, right? This is a pitch. If you're building some data system, I want you to use Data Fusion. So I'm trying to pitch why. So the the high level story is, it shouldn't be surprising. And I, like if you're not familiar with it, how it data systems are implemented, maybe it would be surprising. But it, it basically looks like you would expect a class, uh, textbook. Uh, uh, data systems look like. Partly that's because it was basically written as part of a textbook uh, writing exercise by Andy Grove originally. But so it basically works out of the box, and at a high level, you can basically start with very, very little code. I think I, I have it on the next slide. Whoops. Um, you start with very, very little code. It works out of the box. You get a high performance uh, SQL engine that you can write, you know, with almost no effort. And then it's got API hooks that you can specialize all the in individual implementations uh, basically however you want, right? There's hooks basically everywhere. So the idea is you can start with something simple, very low work, and then as you have time and effort and need, you can invest more time to make it more custom. And it's, it is pretty boring in the sense that if you know how query engines work, it should be super, super familiar. 
which I'm not going to talk about it. But at a high level, I think I've said this before, what that means is you start with something that works very quickly, and then you can quickly iterate and add uh, as your availing, available engineering capacity allows. Just to give you some actual, like this is actually how you install data fusion if you're familiar with Rust, right? Like there's three commands. One of them is going to directory, so it's like, it's really, really simple um, to get up and running. Right, you get this, and you compile it, and you can start running SQL against files, like immediately, and then also customize it all. So why, I think I basically talked about this, but this is my version of the long-term trend. You know, like systems, it's only getting more diverse, right? So like there's more and more databases all the time that are uh, operating on, that, that do special customized things. And so as it gets more sophisticated in order to drive technology into there, you need stuff like data fusion so you don't have to continue to reinvent the lowest level pieces and you can innovate at the top. Uh, I think I've basically said all this, but uh, basically when you do this, you focus on what makes your project special, not the same stuff that uh, people already know how to implement, and that you share the cost. I want to say, it's not like you get it for free necessarily. Right? You still got to do cost, you got to integrate, you got you to pay, pay effort. This is going to be the next part of my talk, but like, the idea is instead of, the alternative is you have to build it all yourself, right? So you're probably better off, obviously I'm biased, right? But you're better off coming working with us. Uh, don't, don't just accept it that what it is. Like, come work with us, make it better. So finally, how, right? This is, this is more. So I just wanted to start with an anecdote. Like when I start, so I worked in enterprise software for 21 years, right? Working for companies, writing comp uh, software for, for different companies. And I worked at places like IBM and HP and a variety of startups and stuff, Oracle. Um, and so when I thought, we're gonna write a whole bunch, like I'm gonna write some high performance query engine on the internet with a whole bunch of people like that I didn't know, and I had no idea how good engineers they were. I thought it was gonna end up like like this, this parable, right? And if you're not familiar with this, this is the British government asked the internet what they should call their fancy new boat, right, their new research vessel or whatever, and the internet decided it was gonna be called Bodie McBoatface, which of course they politely said no way. But but like that's an example, right? Like, you know, you just turn, turn loose on a whole bunch of people on the internet, I kind of expected not great things to happen. So instead, what actually happened was, actually at least one of the other authors here, right? we built up enough technology here that, that we could publish in Sigma, it was one of the big database conferences, and it was very, people came and it was, it was good, and like, like the mere fact you can get this level of technology by harnessing the power of people across the world to working together, I think is very, very impressive. Right, the re oh, and the other thing is I just I actually gave the first talk in this series, which is uh, Andy Pablo is a famous database professor at CMU, has a, uh, seminar series every fall about different database technologies. And this fall, we're talking about database building blocks. And it's basically more or less a who's who of data fusion users, which is pretty exciting. So there's at least one other, I think, speaker here. Um, but, it, but it's very, very cool. Actually, and I gave the first one on Monday. Uh, I'm almost done. So as a frame of reference, I also like, I really wanted you to know, this is not like some product that I'm selling, right? Or that the company's selling or that we're giving to you or that you have to accept as it, as it is, right? Like it's, it's really, a project that we're all working on together. I know that sounds like weird, right, whatever. You can put it in pure capitalistic terms is that we're all sharing the investment cost together for a shared project. But, um, but the point is it's not just something like that you're taking, right? The whole, to make it really good, you have to work together to make it better. Obviously, that's a plug, come work on us. Uh, right, so just a couple of things. Uh, I, I think I'm running low on time, so maybe I'll talk a little bit here uh, quickly. The differences between enterprise software development and, you know, like I said, I worked worth this. It's pretty awesome, right? You don't have to fix all the bugs. You have help, right? It's, it's amazing. You uh, take contributions from everyone. That took me a long time to get over. It's not just like some sub-select group of people like we're accepting features from, like we're basically everyone. Uh, fascinating, I also found the actual technical discussions are much less painful. Like, like there's many, I don't know why, but I think people who have big egos tend not to go towards open source because they have other places to vent on the internet. And, <laughs> and, and, and the other thing that's really weird, people ask me like, what's the roadmap, what's the roadmap? Since it's not a centralized, central plan thing, there's not really a roadmap. It, the roadmap is often driven mostly by the people who want to drive it forward, like who are contributing, which takes a lot of getting used to. The other th uh, you know, but on the other hand, there's actually an awful lot of similarities that, that you'll find very familiar, right? It's just a bunch of people working together, and so acknowledging them and thanking them actually makes a big difference. Providing explicit feedback also makes a big difference keeping the code moving, don't let it sit there, um, and whatever. And clear tickets also, you know, if you have a problem, I know it seems weird, but like seriously, fi if you could file a ticket describing the problem and clearly showing how, like what the, what the issue is, almost guaranteed someone else will fix it for you, right? Like if you file a clear one, it's, it's amazing. Like it's almost like magic. So uh, by the way, it also works in industry as well, but um, 
I can't, I can't get over it. Anyway, I'm also finally going to talk about Apache. It's uh, Data Fusion's Apache Software Foundation project. What that really gives you right, is a predictable foundation. It's like this, the rules of running the project are basically well understood. This, the license is stable. Like it's not going to change after 20 years. Right? It's, the chance of it changing is basically zero. The communication is totally in the open. It's done a very good job. Oh shit! I'm already. I'm doing good. All right. So the other thing is um. The communication is only open, and it really encourages multi-vendor participation. This is also something I think is very important, right? If you want to drive a piece of technology like this that's got lots and lots of low-level hard engineering challenges that went into it, you have to basically be able to sustain investment from the long term from a lot of different people, right? Yes, there's some hobbyists. Yes, there's some students that are working on it. But there's also many people who get paid for as a living, right, to build products that use data fusion. And so in order for them all to be able to, to be com comfortable and work together well, uh, having the structure of the Apache Software Foundations worked great. And just as, an, as a parable, um, we have a bunch of people who work for Apple who work on, work on the project. And they basically told us, like, they can't just contribute to open source projects as part of their job unless it's been explicitly blessed by the company. And it's like a six to eight month process to get it blessed you know, internally with the lawyers. And like, if, it's not, if it's not one of the big software foundations, forget about it. So the mere fact that we're part of Apache like, allows like there's a whole subset of people who couldn't even participate if it wasn't sort of for this clear governance. And of course, there's also now a long-term maintenance strategy. If you're going to go build this, uh, a story at least, right? If you're going to go build your product on top of this open source foundation, you want some confidence that it's not going to go away when the VCs take, want their money back, right? Or that someone has a child and has to do something different with their life or the funding cycle shift or whatever, right? Like it's not that any individual like you know contribution would uh, not affect the project, but the project itself is, is bigger than anyone or any one organization. So I think, I think that's a very important foundation, and I think yeah, it, it's basically worked way way better than I ever would have expected. Right, I, I came from this model of working for big companies, writing proprietary software, and so the mere fact that this works uh, is still sort of somewhat bewildering to me. Um, just to give you a sense of like how well does it work, here's some numbers that I put together for a couple of slides. There's approximately 600 distinct contributors. That number is kind of messed up because of how the, the Git history works. But I mean, it's, it's many hundreds of people have contributed over time. Of course, the vast majority of them contributed like one PR, right? But, like, but there's, there's a lot of people who contributed over time. There's 13 PMC members. So that's the, the people who help drive the project forward, make sure that it continues to follow the, the Apache way. There's, in addition, there's 33 additional people who can commit to the repository. And just there were 73 people of which a substantial number of them, I think, are in this room, who contributed to the last release, which was released a couple of weeks ago. And, and it's been basically like this for the last three years. We do monthly releases. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's it. So you know, I think I've told people, I told someone else earlier today that my personal goal for this thing is to get it used in a 1,000 projects. When I, because you know, I've worked with various enterprise companies, right? I could do a lot of different things. I think this is what gets me excited, is like build technology that's actually widely, widely used across across lots of different products. And so when I started, I basically picked 1,000 because it seemed like a number that was impossibly high, right? but like a suitable goal. It was easy to say. Um, and now, I, I mean, I don't actually know how many projects use Data Fusion because it's open source. No one has to tell me, right? I know this, you can guess sometimes based off people file bugs or whatever, but like unless you tell, tell us or file bugs, like we have no idea you're using it. Um, so, so we're getting, I don't know if we're really at 1,000, but we're, we're definitely, at, definitely in the hundreds, I would say. But again, I don't actually have numbers to verify that, but certainly, certainly real. So anyway, that's my talk. Thank you all very much for coming. Again, thank you to Microsoft for doing this. You know, I encourage you all to come build your next product on it, build your next thing on it, come help us, come help us make it cool. Like, you know, if you're interested in query technology, there's not, you know, historically there were very few places both in the world and also companies where you could actually work on that, that low level technology, right? That were selling databases or working on query engines. So now the fact that you have the opportunity to work, you know, if that's the kind of thing that gets you excited, it might, might or might not be, right? But if it gets you excited, uh, there's a community that would love to have you. So anyway, thank you all very much.